Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. I'm here at this year's New Game Warden Training Academy, where today they're learning and practicing water enforcement techniques. They're not only running an obstacle course while still in full uniform, but they're also wearing 15 pounds of weights as well. Oklahoma Game Wardens are some of the most thoroughly trained and most widely skilled law enforcement forces in not only our state, but in the entire country. And every day, their number one priority is to safely interact with sportsmen and be prepared for literally any situation you could possibly find yourselves dealing with in the outdoors. Highly trained and qualified game wardens border to border. Just another reason to love Oklahoma and the adventures that await you. Well, where we're at is the Butterfly House here at a place called the Papillion in Honor Heights Park. And uh, we have uh, one of the best displays of butterflies in Oklahoma. These butterflies are all found in Oklahoma or at least in the southwest. Right now we probably, on any given day, we probably have around 10 different species of butterflies and they vary as the summer progresses. I kind of was raised on Fort Gibson Lake in the outdoors and spent most of my youth out hunting and fishing and hiking. When I went to college, I focused on science, particularly zoology and even more specifically on ornithology. Um, after I finished my college, I went to teach school. Uh, once I finished my teaching and retired from teaching, I started working here at the pavilion at Honor Heights Park last fall um, and been doing that since. So it gives me a chance to still stay in the educational field, but at the same time, I get to be outdoors more. I spend a lot of time on nature hikes, out in the field collecting butterflies for the butterfly house, uh, working in the gardens, and um, I enjoy that, get out of the classroom now. All right, you're familiar with the life cycle of the butterfly? Mm -hmm. So you have the eggs, you have the caterpillar, and then we have the pupa, which this is what these are. Mm -hmm. These are chrysalises. So we got different species of chrysalises here. We've got, there's monarch, we've got tiger swallowtail, we've got the zebra longwings, the great southern white. But what we have to do is I have to get these ready to hang in the butterfly house. So, you know, in nature, the, butter, the caterpillar attaches itself to, like on the bottom mm -hmm. of the leaf, you know? So what we're going to do is kind of simulate that. So what I do is put just a little dot of hot glue okay. on my string, and then I take the chrysalis, if I can get that, and I attach it to the glue, like that, to the stem. And basically it hangs like that until it emerges, okay? So why is this made out of corkscrew? 
Well, that keeps the string from sliding left or right on it. Keeps it, it in place. And it's also so it doesn't make too much friction. Right. Well, you know, when the butterfly emerges, he starts to kind of squirm around a little bit, and you don't want the string to work its way off of the rod, so it kind of helps keep it in so place. So a bumpy thing? Yeah, kind of rough like that. Well, there's been a great decline in the number of pollinators in, in the world. Um, I'm sure you've heard stories about the monarchs and stories about honeybees. Well, this is a chance to educate people about the value of pollinators and the necessity to try to protect them. So this is a great tool that we use to, to, to accomplish that. Yeah, my background coming into this job is mainly in ornithology. And my knowledge of the uh, world of Lepidoptera, which is the study of butterflies, was very limited. But since I've been doing this job and collecting butterflies, I've learned a, a lot, a lot of information. Um, in the park, I mean, we've got tiger swallowtails, we've got black swallowtails, pipe vine, uh, spice bush, red spotted purples. I mean, I can go on with quite a big list, but there's a lot of different species of butterflies in our park that I've learned about. Yeah, we're, we get visitors from all over the country um, come here. I think, of course, Honor Heights is renowned for its azaleas, and, but people come here and realize we got this butterfly house and they really enjoy coming here and interacting with the butterflies. You know, butterflies will land on, their, land on them. Uh, they have a chance to see them up close and personal, see chrysalises, see the butterflies emerge from their chrysalises. It's, it's, uh, they get to see all stages of the butterfly development. Well, one of the questions I sometimes am asked by the public is, you know, why do we need to have a butterfly house? Why do we need to educate people about butterflies? Well, I can tell you as an avid duck hunter, waterfowler, um, you know, people wonder why we have waterfowl hunting. Well, understand that um, you need to educate people about every species of living things on earth and their place in the ecosystem, that they all play a part. Well, in turn, the butterflies have a very important role they play with pollinating plants. And if you think about it, all the plants that you eat, even the meat that you eat, involves a pollinator directly or indirectly. So they're very valuable, so it's important to get that message across. And so, you know, I, I feel like if you're a true, you know, naturalist or outdoorsman, you need to understand that big picture. appreciate you inviting me up here for bow fishing. This is definitely the right time of year, but now these, this is going to be something a little different. Grass carp, you say? Grass carp, Neil. These uh, fish escaped the pond up here. They're now in this little stream, and they need to be got out of here before they get in any of our public water systems. Ah, this is fantastic. Just a nice little overgrown. It's clear enough. You can see down here pretty good. Now. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. The dam's up there, and, you, and uh, they came out when it flooded. Huh? Right, that's right. They came out when uh, they went over the overflow, when they got excess rains, and then got down in this little creek channel, and uh, then they wound up uh, staying right here in this little pool area. Yeah, I think I can see one in there right now. I better get ready. Yeah. Uh, these are some nice fish. These fish will go somewhere close to 10, 20 pounds apiece. Oh, good. In the early 80s, Oklahoma legalized grass carp for private use in farm ponds uh, for vegetation control. They're vegetation eaters, and a lot of ponds get choked with vegetation. Oh, I think I see one there right now. Okay, Neil, try for one. You got him. Oh, man. He went under that log. Let's see if I can get him. Boy, they do fight good. Yeah, they do. There must be a bunch. Look at all the mud stirred up in there. Let's see if I can get him up from under that log. Yeah, you got him. Oh. Let me help you. 
Oh, golly, what a fighter. Oh, he's getting all tangled around there. Boy, I, now I've got some tennis shoes in there. Ah, he's is just going to go in there barefooted. Huh? Yeah, country boys, Neil. <laughs> He's still got a lot of, whoa! <laughs> he's still got a lot of fight in him. See, he swam underneath that thing. Okay. Oh. Trying to retrieve your fish. Okay. Oh, nice fish. I still can't whoa. figure out why you shot the pup. <laughs> well, I don't know. He's not bad. Whoops, watch that point. Okay. Oh, yeah. Golly. Nice one. Now, you say these are real good eating? Oh, yeah. They're. I shot them just a little far back. But... They're particularly good smoked. These were brought in to control the aquatic vegetation. And uh, we recommend stocking them at about a rate of 10 grass carp about eight inches long per infected acre or weed cover acre. And uh, this will help clear up the problems without eliminating the vegetation. You want some vegetation because some covers you know is good. Well, I, yeah, I understand there's some lakes where they, they didn't quite get that rule of thumb down. They've got a little bit too many and it really cleared the vegetation. That's out. right. Well, uh, one of the big problems landowners have is they don't stock per infected acre, they say the pond's 10 acres, I want 10 grass carp the acre, therefore I want a hunter, <laughs> and they annihilate the cover completely, you know, and that's not good. So they're a good tool, but they must be used properly. Well, they're great, uh, evidently very sporting. That was fun. I, yeah. I'm ready to try to shoot another one. Let's, maybe we can uh, see one swimming by here. It's starting to clear up a it's little bit. It's starting to clear up a little bit. Looks like it might be able I tell you, they're spooky. They're kind of almost like you need to take a stand like deer hunting, you know. John, I found a spot over here that looks looks pretty good where I think I can see him. Okay. Yeah, that glare is vicious today, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, they're one, one right there. I've got these Polaroids on. If I can shoot around this wire, I don't know. Yeah, we got a big fish working up in here, Neil, somewhere. There he swirled, see him? Oh, yeah. Yeah. There goes one right now, back there. Hey, got him. Who's got who? <laughs> oh, man. This, this brush makes it especially challenging. Ah, oh, good. Oh, yeah, I think he is nicer one. I don't get tangled up in this. Whew. Boy, those are nice fish. And you say they're say they're good eating? Oh yeah. Real good eating. Oh yeah. Beautiful. That's great. You know, maybe we ought to let uh let uh, Steve Weber, the cameraman, try a shot or two at this. I don't know whether he's ever shot a fish with a bow. Might be good. There goes a big one up above, Neil. Ooh, get him. Good, you got him. Excellent. Nice shot. Almost shot over him. <laughs> Great. That away. Whoops, now he's getting caught in that, <laughs> that notch. Oh, good one. Yeah. Whew. 
I think you got me beat. <laughs> Well, but I noticed a jet flew over in honor of you getting that grass carp. Yeah. I think that was the biggest one yet. Yeah. John, I think Neil probably shot all the fish in this little hole here. It's probably about time to move on. We've got some other projects we need to get done, but I sure want to thank you for the lesson in grass carpology. You bet, Steve. We've got, we still got the dress, though. So you're not getting off that easy. <laughs> People that shot him have to dress him, right? I think that would only be right. We are fixing to head up about two miles upriver to a little spot all the locals call the bubble. I'm not really sure exactly what it is, but it's a place that holds some fair amount of numbers of bait fish. Uh, this past week they've been pretty, pretty abundant in there. The current's not real strong today, so I hope to find some in there. Pretty much all fish we eat on shad, so we're going to go throw a cast net and hope to find some bait. Every year, early summer, late spring, uh, when the water's running pretty good after the rains have came, the catfish get in here pretty heavy and you can usually, you know, and in fact, this week we have caught a lot of fish out of here. Um, the water gets rolling pretty good and this, the shad start moving and the, the fish come up. And when we're fishing out here, we like to use fresh shad. Don't get that on camera. <laughs> so the fresher the shad, the more bites you're gonna have. Uh, the sit gets off better with no shad, and so the fresher your bait, the more bites you're going to have. Um, we've been friends since like third grade, I'd say, a little before that. And we've had the same schedule almost all of the years. I've only been fishing like a few times and it was like five years ago maybe. So I don't really remember how long. Same with me. I haven't been fishing since I was like seven. So we're, we're drifting. I've got a four ounce sinker, Carolina rigged. What are we doing? I'm just talking to the camera. Oh. I got a four ounce sinker, Carolina rigged above cut bait. We're using shad today. Um, you don't have to use a four ounce sinker, but if that current picks up, it's nice to have that bait get to the very bottom. Um, and we're just taking the sinker, letting it go all the way to the bottom. When it hits bottom, right there, we're setting our bell and we're just pulling it about two foot off the bottom and letting the current just take that bait down um, with the boat. Get it, Kendall. Real. <coughs> just real. Okay, okay, I'm reeling. I'm reeling. Mine came off. <laughs> oh, I got one. He's heavy. Help me. <laughs> right, straight up. I'm going to come over there to you. Oh, you did it. I know. Looks like he's cracking. Um, I was kind of scared because it was kind of heavy and I couldn't get it. <laughs> and then I was just sitting there and it yanked. I didn't know if it was actually a one because it just kind of drifted off, but then it started pulling again. So did it tap it or just take off running with it? It like took off running with it because it was like pulling away that way. I like to start at the tail, enter and turn the shad back through the body. Back through one more time. And to make sure the bait stays on the hook, I like to take make a half hitch and put it over the last part of the shad onto the hook itself and so that the bait stays on the entire hook the entire time. That's how I like to hook mine. Wait, no, I got 
him, I got him, I got him, I got him. Straight up. Very big. <laughs> I thought it was bigger than that. We ended up catching six, and we had some bites as well. We had probably 10 fish that we had missed. Uh, they just didn't get all the way in the mouth. So, but had a good day. We got six to clean. We'll go up on the bank, and I'll show you guys how to fillet these catfish and maybe give you guys a chance to, to try it out as well. So go ahead and reel those things in. We'll get this bait off and go load the boat up and clean those fish up real quick. Yes, sis. Right. He's taking it. Right. <laughs> okay, turn it left. Okay, go. There we go. It was fun. I'm kind of sad I didn't catch a fish, but it was fun. I enjoyed it. We didn't catch a lot of fish today, and that's okay. You don't, every time you go out, you're not going to catch your limit every time. And that's just part of fishing. That's just part of being on the, on the river, on the lake, wherever you're at. You're not going to do it every single time. And that's, that was the case today. But I got to be with two kids today that have never been on the river like this. they never caught catfish like this. If you have an opportunity to take someone uh, fishing, hunting, exploring, hiking, whatever it might be in the outdoors, it doesn't have to be fishing, it can be anything, take that opportunity and do that. Um, a lot of kids these days don't have that advantage to do that. I'm in a position where I get to go a lot, and so it's it's very rewarding to me to be able to take someone who doesn't get to do these things out there and do it for the first time and see the smile on their face and the joy it brings to them. Um, so if you have that opportunity, I, I would beg and plead with you to take, take that chance and go do that. Well, we hope that today's stories remind you that Oklahoma is such a perfect state to explore. So, however you choose to enjoy our state's incredible natural world, remember that your adventure starts with Outdoor Oklahoma. Outdoor Oklahoma is produced by the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation and is proud to serve and be funded entirely by sportsmen and women and outdoor enthusiasts who love and appreciate all things wild in the great state of Oklahoma. <laughs>